Hey everybody. So a lot of producers talk about the importance of having the sub bass of your kick in phase with the sub bass of the actual bass part of the 808. And that is absolutely right to a point. So when we talk about phase, we are referring to the position of the waveform of the sub bass parts of our kick and the bass line. Any phase variation between the sub bass is really where any mixing problems occur. So for this, I'm gonna drag in my audio example sine wave. Okay, so just a simple sub bass, and you can see it's just clearly a sine wave. It just goes up and down, oscillates. And all I'm gonna do is duplicate that track so we've got two of them. Okay, and I'll solo that as well so you we can hear both of them. So one on its own. Okay, and if you add the other one in, and these are perfectly in phase, you simply get a louder sub bass. That's what happens when they add together. Now, if I zoom right in, I'm gonna turn off my snap and I'll just actually loop this so it plays over and over and I'm just going to move the bass along so it goes out of phase. So just for example, that is completely out of phase. So they're going in opposite directions, all right? So I'll just play it and move it. You can hear it starts to get a bit quieter and then eventually when they're absolutely out of phase, yeah, actually you can't hear anything apart from that tiny little bit at the beginning there, like a little click. So what's happening is the waveforms are canceling each other out. So you can imagine if you've got a kick with some sub bass in and you've got an 808 bass sound or a bass sound and they are out of phase like this, this is the problem that it causes. So you can either have sub being completely removed when they play together, or for example, when they're in phase, you'll have the sub bass adding together, which may or may not be desirable in your particular track. So you think, great, just keep them in phase and all will be well. Well, not so fast there, my little sausage. That's only possible when you're using audio for both your kick and bass, so you can actually see the waveforms like we're doing here. Obviously, a lot of the time you're gonna be using a sampler to trigger the kick in your project, and potentially you're gonna be using a synthesizer to play the bass part of the 808, in which case you're not gonna be able to line them up like you can here. And just to make it even more difficult, what if you're using more than one note for your bass line? So at the moment, these are just playing exactly the same note. So you could say, yes, you could have your kick, say in C, the key of C, and have your bass in the key of C, and that's absolutely fine. But then if you wanna have your bass changing pitch, like you actually want to have some kind of melody or melodic attribute to the bass line, then of course that's changing pitch, which means that these also will change. And that causes its own problems because if you change the pitch of one, these waveforms will either stretch or get more compressed. I don't mean compressed in the sense of a plug-in compressor, but they'll get tighter together, which of course means that at some points, yes, they will be in phase, and then other points they'll be out of phase. Just to show you what that sounds like. All right, so here I've just raised the pitch of the second bass up by two semitones, and we can see if we zoom in, like sometimes it's completely out of phase, and then other times it's completely in phase. And what that sounds like when you hear it just on the sub alone is that, or if I raise it up, So you can hear it creates this really warbled kind of effect. And that's what will happen if you have a kick or the sub bass of the kick and the sub bass of the bass in different keys. All right, so what does all of this mean? It simply means you can't rely purely on having the kick and the bass in phase. You need to incorporate other mixing techniques or nine times out of 10, you're gonna need to incorporate other mixing techniques, which is what we're gonna look at in the next couple of lessons. However, and this is, the most important thing to take away from this lesson, the simplest way to make sure the sub of your kick and bass are in phase is to make sure they are in the same key. Now, unfortunately, this does not automatically guarantee 100% success as the starting position of the sub bass might be slightly different in one. So again, it could be you know somewhere like there or it could be there or whatever. So you don't 100% know that that is going to be the cure all for it. Or you could be using a kick where the sub bass actually drops in pitch over time, which is really common for a kick drum to do. So <laughs> let's go through some simple tricks you can use to pretty much guarantee success. The first thing that we want to do is actually shorten our kick. All right, so at the moment, in fact, let's get rid of these two audio examples now because we don't need them anymore. 
and I'll just set my loop over the whole project and looking at our kick, it's got this great big tail on it. Now we don't need that tail because basically the tail of the kick is being provided by the bass sounds. Okay, so we can actually shorten that off quite a bit. Now just remember that you do want a bit of the sub bass in there just so it does retain its impact. Probably a little bit too short. So something like that sounds pretty good. You can still hear some of the sub bass. It's still got a nice bit of impact. All right, so that is the first step. And then the second step is to make sure that they are in the same key as the bass, okay? So how do we do that? Obviously with the bass line, it's really simple. You can look at the MIDI. It's an F, so we know it's in the key of F, easy peasy. But if you want to find out what the key of the kick is, then we need to bring up a graphic equalizer and look at where the fundamental frequency is. Now I've covered this a little bit. So if you remember, you just gotta find where the highest point of the waveform is. And then at least in this graphic EQ, it actually tells you the key, or down there or down there, wherever I go. So let's analyze the kick. So it's almost perfectly in C and our baseline's in F. So what we can do is go into the kick and raise it up to F. Now this isn't always the perfect solution because sometimes pitching up the kick or pitching down the kick can sound a little bit weird. So it might just be that you need to pick a different kick that is closer in key than your existing one. But in this case, it actually sounds pretty good. And that sounds way better already. It's interesting though, because on the notes where it's playing the same key, so I'll just bring up the bass line so we can see what we've got there. So most of the notes are in F. So the phase in, of the kick and the bass sound pretty much perfect. But of course, there's these few notes here where they're actually in a different key. And you can actually hear when the bass line's playing in a different key that it is affecting the kick or the sub bass together is just adding together and making it sound a bit destabilized. So it's perfect there. It may be hard to detect again when you're new to this, but just concentrate purely on the very, very low frequencies. There's just a little bit of destabilization on those different notes and exactly for the reason that I showed you with that audio example sine wave. Okay, but we are a good portion of the way to getting that kick and that sub bass to work together. Now, one thing that has happened though, because we've pitched up that kick, if I just play that on its own, go into it. So it was there. And you can hear there's obviously much more sort of prominent sub bass there. But as we raise it up, the sub bass gets higher in pitch and therefore sounds like it's been lessened. So what I'm going to do quickly is just add a BX sub filter, which I've talked about already, so I won't go into much detail under EQ. And I'm going to use this to boost the sub bass of the kick because we've lost some in pitching it up. So it's just got more punch now. That's nicer, or at least the sub bass part has. Okay, sounded pretty good. That's a little bit too loud, perhaps. Just back that off a bit. So in this lesson, we are going to look at dynamically EQing or side chaining your 808 kick and bass. Now I actually recommend not using side chain compression, but actually using dynamic EQ, or you could potentially use a multiband compressor, up to you how you do it. But you do really want to use a multiband process rather than a single band. I'll just quickly show you what single band sounds like, but you'll find that it just takes the energy, if you're side chaining by quite a lot anyway, out of the baseline. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to create a group for these two channels, the baselines, because we've got two channels and I only want to add my side chaining effects to one of them. So for now, I'll just quickly add a compressor and we'll look at how this reacts. So I'll just very quickly set up my side chain. Standard settings as always, no attack, no hold, no release. Ratio three to four to one. 
So we're getting some action on the game reduction meter. It's probably not very noticeable. It's only a few decibels. Uh, and I also want to turn off auto makeup gain. Very important. So I'll just make this more extreme. I can hear what it's doing, but I will make it more extreme. You can hear it kind of sucks some of the life out of the bass line. Where it's being dipped in volume and then just after the kick ends playing, the bass line just takes a sort of few milliseconds to go back up to full volume. So that's why you don't necessarily want to use sidechain. You know, if you're only dipping it by a few decibels to control some of the sub bass, that's fine. But normally I'd say something like dynamic EQ will be much more transparent, but still get the same effect of making the kick and bass work together. Now, very quickly, the whole reason we might want to actually dynamically compress or dynamically EQ the sub bass out of the bass when the kick is playing is for all the same reasons that I've discussed before. And especially if you've got a bass line where you've got lots of different pitches, obviously this is fairly straightforward, mainly in F, but we are using some other keys. But if say you're, you know, you're going up here and down there, then almost every time it hits, it's going to be out of phase with the kick. And in that case, you really need to be ducking the bass frequencies of the bass part so they don't conflict with the kick because they will if you don't. All right. So very important to understand that. So again, you could use sine chain compression or we can use dynamic EQ. So I'm just going to go through and do this quickly, although we've kind of looked at it already. Uh, let's just change this to the TDR Nova. And again, I'm going to set up the sidechain or the Cubase part of the sidechain using the kick as the sidechain input. And then I have to activate it on here by going to external sidechain. And for this, I would most likely use a low shelf, although we would turn the Q right up, Ooh, not even that much. And we're literally going to dip really anything starting at below about 100 to like 80 hertz, which is the sub bass part. Okay. And I'm just going to bring that up to zero. Activate the compressor part, ratio three and a bit to one. No attack because we want this to be super quick, almost unnoticeable. And then we'll just bring down the threshold. And to be fair, you have to concentrate very hard to actually hear that the sub bass is being turned down, but it makes the mix so much cleaner. And when you listen to this very loudly on a loud system, you will really come to notice what a difference this makes. In fact, if I turn down the kick, I might even make it a bit more noticeable. So obviously that's way too extreme but you get the idea even that extreme it sounds better than the compressor did because it's still leaving all of the other frequencies the high bass the mid-range the highs and it's leaving them untouched and remember of course when you're listening to this and trying to decide what it's doing you have to listen to the very small period of time where the kick is actually playing and because we've shortened the kick it's an incredibly short amount of time. So that is exactly what you're focusing on, not the rest of the tail of the bass. Just that initial hit and you're listening to the very low sub bass frequencies. And when you do that, you can hear when it's activated, those sub bass frequencies don't suddenly jump out of the mix. And this is exactly why we would do this. It's the same for house music is the same for using an 808 now it depends how much you want to dip the bass frequencies out sometimes you want more of those sub bass frequencies because it kind of gives that harder hitting sound so you've got to balance it depending on what you want but for sure adding control like this especially when you have a bass line with different keys in i.e it's changing in pitch over time is an absolute must that you dip those sub bass frequencies when the kick is playing now, if you really want to be able to get the perfect low end in any track you make, acoustic 
or EDM, then click the link in the description below to check out the full low-end masterclass. It's over 34 lessons and we cover everything from setting up your equipment and environment to get the best results possible, all the way through to advanced processing techniques of the low end of your tracks, down to the individual elements and the low end as a whole. Thank you very much for watching. See you in the next one.